This is Surfing Through Cinema. I'm your host, Hawaii Harry. Today, I'll be discussing the next film for Disney Week. This is an animated version of the classic legend of Briar Rose, and based off the classical orchestration of Pyotr Ilyich Tchaikovsky, this episode is all about Sleeping Beauty 1959. Okay, so some technical details about Sleeping Beauty. So, the argument about the color of the dress that uh, Flora and Meriwether have is actually based off of the animator's dispute over the color of the dress. They couldn't decide if they wanted it pink or blue, and now it's stuck. A lot of people remember that sequence. Alright, and another technical detail. This was the last fairy tale movie Disney made until 1989 with The Little Mermaid, um, 30 years later. Every film after Sleeping Beauty up until that point was based off a book or different other things that weren't fairy tales. And then the last technical detail, each background painting took 7 to 10 days to paint. A standard background for an animated film from Disney only took one working day, but these ones took 7 to 10 days because they are intricately detailed and uh, based off of medieval art as well as modernist art. It was kind of a blend of the two. And uh, this was all done by Evand Earl, who was um, a background artist for Disney. And he his style really comes out. Uh, the animators weren't too happy with it because it took a lot of extra work. Especially considering <clears throat> they were now using Technorama again, which was very, very difficult to adapt to. And uh, the actual animation itself, because of how intricate it was, took between three to five years they worked on it from 1958 1953 to 1958 so yeah five years honestly if he didn't put in that effort and that detail i don't think we'd be talking about it as much today all right so let's get into the plot so king stefan and queen leah they have a daughter named aurora and she's blessed with many gifts from the fairies meriwether fauna and flora maleficent appears and curses aurora that on her 16th birthday, she'll prick her finger on a spinning wheel and die. But the last fairy to give a gift, Meriwether, she gives her the gift that she'll actually fall asleep, not die when she pricks her finger. And so the fairies decide to take Aurora in to kind of keep her away from Maleficent and try and hide her. And they raise her themselves. And 16 years later, Aurora, she's now, now called Briar Rose to conceal her true identity, uh, she encounters Prince Philip, and unbeknownst to both of them, they're actually betrothed to each other, and they fall in love. But much to the dismay of uh, Aurora, she finds out she's actually a princess from the fairies, and she thinks that um, Prince Philip was just a local boy, and they say, no, you can't marry him, you have to marry a prince. And it's just one of those moments where you wish that there was more communication, so then she would understand, oh... This is the guy I'm supposed to marry, but nevertheless, this adds needed tension into the movie. And so Aurora is brought back to the castle, and she's pretty distraught and sad, not being able to see Prince Philip anymore. And Maleficent finds her, kind of puts her into a trance, and um, she's put to sleep by pricking her finger. Then Maleficent goes back to the cottage because she knows Prince Philip's going to come there, and she decides to take him to her dungeon and the three fairies they find aurora asleep so then they decide okay let's put the whole castle to sleep so that they don't know what's going on and they go to save philip they help him escape they give him a new sword and shield and maleficent flies back to the castle because that's where prince philip's going he's going towards it she covers it with thousands of thorns and he has to cut through it and then eventually when he gets to the front he has to face her, and she turns from the witch into a giant dragon. And a huge climatic battle takes place, but Philip comes out on top. He ends up killing the the dragon uh, with the help of the fairies. They helped him a little bit. And Prince Philip, he goes in, he kisses Aurora. She realizes who he really is, and they live happily ever after. All right, well, that's the plot to Sleeping Beauty. I'm going to go on a break real quick, but first, here's a message from our sponsor. This podcast is brought to you by Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, 
It's the easiest way to make a podcast. Here's how. It's totally free. There are tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast from your computer and even your cell phone. But that's not all. Anchor distributes your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many, many more. You could even make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. Anchor is everything you need to make a complete podcast all in one small place. So go on and download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started today. Okay, so we're back from our break. Now I'm going to get into some critical views and my personal views on Sleeping Beauty. So, Time Magazine gives it a 50 out of 100, saying the drawings are crude, um, this is more of a monster movie than a fairy tale. Um, They did not like this movie. They felt that it was so far off from the original legend that um, it was almost unrecognizable. And then Rotten Tomatoes gave it an 89% based on 44 reviews, and and it has an audience score of 80% based off of Uh, 200,000 views so it seems the audience and critics are kind of divided on this movie it seems that audiences they like it but not as much as say Snow White or Cinderella and that shows again on IMDB it has a 7.2 so it's many consider it to be a good Disney movie but not a great Disney movie it's kind of on the level of um of ones I'll review in the future like uh, the sword and the stone and all of that it's uh it's more appreciated for the design than it is the actual story and so yeah i i think audiences when it first came out it, it didn't gross its initial um box off it didn't make a lot of money at the box office uh it cost about six million in 1959 dollars to make it and it it barely made that so it was a financial flop and it wasn't until there were re-releases of it that it was brought up to the second highest grossing film in 1959, second only to Ben-Hur, which was a box office phenomena and it won all kinds of awards at the Academy. Uh, but this one didn't. This one, audiences didn't like for a while. It wasn't until about the 70s and 80s that it got a revival and people started appreciating it more. All right, so now let's get into my personal views. I love Maleficent. I think she's a great, great Disney villain. Um, Although many critics didn't like her, I personally think she's my favorite Disney villain because she's very dark, but rather than being um, super out out there like the Queen of Hearts, for example, she's more reserved and calculated, and which makes her even more terrifying. Like, you never know when she's going to snap. There's a scene in the movie where she asks her henchman, you know, after all these years, we can't seem to find her. And they're like, yeah, well, we checked every cradle. And she realizes, wait a minute, you were checking for a baby for 16 years? And she just went off on all of them, started electrocuting them. She was just super mad at them. So she's pretty terrifying. Uh, she has her limits. Like, she'll snap at people. And I really like that. I haven't seen the the live-action remake with angelina jolie i hear it's kind of hit or miss as well um but i'm curious to see the differences between this and that movie and the battle between maleficent and prince philip like i said i think was an amazing battle i wish it could have been longer it felt pretty short and uh, a little too easy i kind of wish philip was on his own fighting against her instead of having the fairies like put some dust on his sword and then he threw it at her I kind of wish it was more of um, him using his abilities versus just the fairies helping him the whole time. But regardless, I think it was a great battle. All right, then my next point, the background work is amazing. I love the mixture of the gothic architecture and the modernist coloring and design of the characters. I think they blended together really, really well. I think the best design, obviously, is probably... Uh, either Maleficent or Princess Aurora. I I think they're the best designed characters in this movie. And and then after that, I think the fairies. Each of them is kind of unique and more Disney looking than uh, Aurora is. Aurora's design is more angular and has more sharp lines. Whereas the fairies are kind of the classic round, um, you know, cheerful looking characters. Some things I didn't like, 
Um, I felt a lot of the humor didn't really fit in with it. This movie felt a little more serious and definitely needs comic relief. I think the fairies offer that pretty well. But there were some scenes where uh, Prince, uh, King Stefan and Prince Philip's dad were together getting drunk, talking about their kids with each other, and there's like a jester who kept drinking. I think that scene could have been cut. Uh, it didn't really help the plot along. I mean, it showed there was tension that they their kids weren't there, but I really don't think it was needed. I think it felt out of place compared to the rest of the movie. And then the fairies, I liked them. Each have a personality that's very unique to each of them. I think they should have been more of the comic relief than anyone else in the movie. I think they they were spot on. Um, though I will say, I think it was interesting that, because they're kind of more of background characters, we know more about them than we do about the actual princess. I wish we actually got to see her and hear her more. Apparently... I didn't count, but apparently she only has like 18 lines in the entire movie, or maybe it's 32. I can't remember, but she has very few lines compared to, uh, say, the fairies, and even Maleficent has more lines. Um, I think, though, just due to the fact that this was a hugely expensive movie and the animation was time-consuming, I think they tried to limit as much as they could. Um, all right, well, those are my thoughts and feelings on Sleeping Beauty. I think I give it a, I give it a 10 out of 10. I really like the design of it, despite the flaws with the humor in it. Um, I still think the blending together of the modernist and gothic architecture is beautiful and phenomenal. I don't think any Disney movie has come close to the design look and the, <clears throat> the that much attention to detail quite on this scale. Alright, so next time I'll discuss the next film for Cinephile Week. And from Soviet-era director Sergei Bondarchuk, this epic movie is split into four different parts, totaling in at around seven and a half hours. Because of this, I'll only be reviewing the first two parts, and, uh, and then the third and fourth part I'll review in the subsequent Cinephile Week uh, a couple weeks later. I'm, of course, talking about War and Peace Parts 1 and 2 from 1966. This is known as a major epic in the Soviet Union, well, now Russia, but this is known as one of their best movies ever, based on the classic classic book by Leo Tolstoy. Some say the book is better, some say this is better, so I'm looking forward to seeing it for the first time. I, uh, I recently just bought it on Criterion. I have the disc for it. So I'm, I'm really excited to check it out. It looks phenomenal. All right. Well, until next time, this has been Surfing Through Cinema with Hawaii Harry. Take care. Thank you for listening to Surfing Through Cinema. Make sure to check us out on Facebook at Surfing Through Cinema with Hawaii Harry and on Instagram with Surfing Through Cinema. We also have a website, www.anchor.fm forward slash surfing through cinema, where you can learn more details on upcoming episodes and on past episodes.